All right, take your Bible this evening if you would. Go to Genesis chapter 2, please. Genesis chapter 2. Genesis 2, notice with me verse number 18. And the Lord God said, It is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helpmeet for him. And out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field, <coughs> excuse me, and every fowl of the air, and brought them unto Adam to see what he would call them. And whatsoever Adam called every living creature, that was the name thereof. And Adam gave names to all cattle, and to the fowl of the air, and to every beast of the field. But for Adam there was not found a help meet for him. Now, Father, we bow before you in prayer as we come to this study this evening. And Lord, I'm asking for your help as I go through this lesson tonight and control my thinking. Help me to say what I ought to say and leave unsaid what doesn't need to be said. And Lord, I pray it would be clear and it would be helpful. And that, Lord, you'd help us to be exactly what you desire us to be. So, Father, speak to our hearts tonight. And, Lord, I pray that each one would receive from you what you would have for them. And I pray that we could all leave in a little bit saying, it sure was good to be in the house of the Lord tonight. Thank you already for the good music and for the fellowship and the prayer time together. And now bless the study of your word. In Jesus' name, amen. We, we won't know... I don't think till we get to heaven, how much of a toll the sin nature has taken upon us as human beings. Did you notice what you read here this evening? That out of the ground, verse 19, that God formed every beast of the field and every fowl of the air, and he brought them unto Adam to see what he would call them. That's that's an amazing statement right there. He brought all the, the, the cattle, the fowls of the air, everything he made and brought it to Adam and said, name this. And whatever Adam named it, that was the name thereof. I don't know about you. I can't remember. <laughs> I couldn't remember the names of all those things. And I, 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 My wife, I remember in college, uh, had a class called zoology. Does that sound familiar to anybody? And uh, all the different, oh, oh my goodness. And, and Adam, Adam named all those. Adam had the mental capacity not to remember the names, to make up the names and call them something different. And God went with whatever Adam called them. He gave them, he had that ability. That's just an amazing thing. Then he's to keep the garden. The Garden of Eden is a, was approximately 300 square miles. That would be a rather big job. But Adam took care of that. You understand the capacity that he must have had? The, uh, I, I know scientists tell us that most of us use less than 10% of our brain's capacity. You know, you, you, if, if, Brother Dean, if you're looking at a computer and it's still got 90% memory, it's pretty good shape. You say, oh, this thing hasn't begun to <laughs> touch what its potential could be. And that's, how, that's how much capacity most of us still have that we haven't used. Somebody says, oh, man, i got so much stuff in my head. Nah, you're not even 10% full. It's amazing, isn't it, the capacity that God made us and how he made us. I mentioned the other night, there's no processor that's ever been manufactured that's better than the processor that's right up there called the human brain. It's incredible uh, how we were made. I believe man has an unlimited capacity to grow and to learn and to achieve. What has hindered us? Sin hindered us. Sin hindered us. That fallen nature. And so all of us have some potential that is untouched. You know, the, the, the difficulty with our fallen nature is it, it is too eager 
to stay that way. We, we, that, that, that part of us that just wants to keep things the way they are, that's the sin nature. Not to change anything, not to improve. We, we kind of like, we, we kind of sing the song, Take my life and let it be. No, we don't say consecrated Lord to thee. We leave that part off. We just say, Lord, I just would let, leave my life and let me alone. Don't, don't, just let me be the way I am. Sometimes people say, well, that's just who I am. But is that who God wants you to be? Is that how God created you to be? You see, what one thing you learn is that you become a believer in Christ is you're not to yield to the old nature anymore. You have a new nature. And we're to yield to the Spirit of God. We're to, we're to, we're to point our, our heart towards Him and not to the old manager that we used to have. And not go after the fallen nature. It's the flesh versus the spirit. And these two are contrary one to the other. And so when we settle for the fallen nature, when we settle to do what the old nature wants us to do, we always fall short of who God wants us to be. We will never attain what God wants us to attain. We'll never be what God desires that we be. Now, how can I be what God wants me to be? Well, I'm glad you asked me that question because that's the Bible study this evening, all right? How can I be who God made me to be? Let me give you seven statements. won't be long tonight, but I think will be practical and helpful, okay? Number one, here's what you do. Number one, desire to be more than to have. You know what the fallen nature focuses on? You know what fallen man focuses on? It focuses on having things. Whoever, uh, listen, they focus more on having things than being something. I, uh, whoever dies with the most toys wins. Really? But people live that way, don't they? Somebody says, well, it's, it's all about the hunt. No, it's not. No, it's not about the hunt. It's, it's not about the beginning and it's not about the ending. It is about the journey. It's called the Christian life. It's called the race that we run. You know what Jesus said in Luke 12 and verse 15? He said unto them, Take heed and beware of covetousness, for a man's life consisteth not in the, do you know it? Abundance of things which he possesses. Jesus said, Your life isn't about things. But you just have to drive down the street and look at people's houses or Look at all the storage facilities to think, you know what? Are you sure it's not about things? People who, who have their cars outside because their garage is full of stuff, they can't put their car in the garage. Things. That's why in our fallen nature, we yield to that. That's why people would rather play the lotto, play the lottery, then try to improve as a person. See, we get to thinking that if I just had more money, if I just had a better car, if I just had a bigger house, if I just, get, if I just got a raise at work, or if I had a different kind of job, we're always thinking that something else is what's going to bring us happiness, or something else is what's going to change our life. Getting more stuff isn't going to change your life. It isn't going to help you. Being what God meant you to be will change your life. Will make you... Listen, people end up having everything to live for, or everything to live with and nothing to live for. That's where people are today. Notice, notice 1 John chapter 2. Would you turn back there with me to 1 John chapter 2? You're familiar with these verses. 1 John chapter 2. Notice verse number 15 with me, will you? Love not the world, neither the what? things, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. 
For all that is in the world, lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passeth away, and the lust thereof. But he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. I mean, remember what the Bible says about a man named Demas. Paul had to write, Demas hath forsaken me, having done what? Love this present world. How many, uh, how many understand the world probably has more to offer tonight than it did in Demas's day? Okay? I was talking to my mom the other day. My mom, for years, was a cashier at Fisher Foods up in Canton. And now, I mean, that's when it was just a grocery store. Anybody remember grocery stores? <laughs> You just went there for groceries, you know. Now it's, you know, all of them have everything. You can get anything you want in these uh, super centers over there. Now it's huge. And I was reading sometime back in, in, in 1976, I think it was, the, the average grocery store had like 6,000 items in it. And now the average, what they call a grocery store, uh, has, I think, nearly 30,000 items in it. It's unbelievable the, 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 how much more stuff is out there now than what was uh, 40 years ago. It's amazing. And so there's much more to fall in love with than there was for Demas. Would you agree? And, and do you think it might be an issue or God wouldn't have had to tell us, don't love the world or the things that are in the world? It must be a temptation for us to want to fall in love with those things. There's so much more to fall in love with. And so we have to remember it's not about things. We have to, have to if we're going to be what God wants us to be, we have to continue to remind ourselves it isn't about having, it's about being. It isn't about getting more things. People get things all the time and they're empty. They're empty. So be what God wants you to be. Number two. Number two, look at learning as exciting and necessary and not a chore. Not a, a chore. Look with me at 2 Timothy chapter 4. Would you look there please? 2 Timothy chapter 4. Paul is writing here his last chapter before his head will come off and he'll die. This is where he, he's giving instructions. He tells them in verse 10 about Demas having uh, forsaken me, love this present world. Verse 11, only Luke is with me. Take Mark and bring him with thee, for he's profitable me for the ministry. Verse 12, and Tychicus have I sent to Ephesus. Now look at verse 13. The cloak that I left at Troas with Carpus, when thou comest, bring with thee, and the what? Books, but especially the parchments. I said, hey, when you come, and by the way, this is a fellow who, who doesn't have long to live. He's at the, the very end of his life. But he says, you know what I want? I want a coat. It may get a little cold, but I want the books. And then I want especially, I want the parchments. I want the Bible. But Paul was still learning and still desiring to learn, even though he knew, look up at verse number 6. I'm ready to be offered. The time of my departure is at hand. I know. I'm, I'm, I, they're they're going to come call my name any time now. And my head's coming off. But until they do, I'm still going to study. I'm still going to read. I'm still going to learn. I'm still going to progress. I'm not going to just settle on what I know and settle on what I have. So 2 Timothy 2.15, study to show thyself approved unto God. A workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Listen, read, read, read. We, one, of the, one of the tragedies of our generation is we don't have readers. Read. You, you have to, it's, a, it's a command of, of the Scripture. I think he told Timothy, till I come, give attendance to reading. Uh, that's, give, give attention to this, Timothy. You, you have to read. You have to continue to learn. That's not a punishment. Don't, don't you hide behind the fact, well, I'm just not a reader. Well, be one. Learn to do something. 
and realize how exciting it is and how good it is to learn something. That you're, you're getting an opportunity to, to, to gather information and gather knowledge and to become and to know some things that you didn't know before. It'll, it'll help you and for you to be prepared for God to use you in many different situations. Someone said, and you've heard it for years, you're the same person you are now this time next year except for the books you read and the people you meet. So how will you be any different on uh, Wednesday? It'll be May 18 next year, 2018. How will you be different this time next year than you are right now tonight? How are you any different tonight than you were this Wednesday night a year ago? And if you say, well, I don't see any difference in my life, then let me ask you a question. What books have you read in the last year? And what people have you talked to in the last year? Maybe that's why you're still the same person. Okay? Make sure learning is exciting and necessary, or you'll never be what God wants you to be. You know, work doesn't have to be a bad thing. One of the, we talked about a few weeks in Sunday school when we talked about work, and we talked about how that we, we seem to focus so much more on a shorter work week now. You know what I mean? Let me just work four days instead of six. You know, God said six days a man ought to work. And then seventh day is he rested. And, and you know, we, we tend to work shorter, and yet you think we'd have so much more time. All the conveniences we have, all the electronics and all the new gadgets we had, we're all designed to think how much more time you'll have. Think how much, more, how much time you'll save. Boy, how many of you found out how much more time you have? Wait a minute, I'll count the hands. Huh, oh, okay. Doesn't work that way, does it? You see, work is good. Don't, don't, you know, there ought to be some folks who look forward to, to, to 7 o'clock and 8 o'clock in the morning instead of 4 and 5 o'clock at night. I look forward to, to clocking in, not, not clocking out. I look forward to working. Work is good. Don't, don't make it a dirty four-letter word. Okay? Work is a good thing. And God, God made, hey, God made Adam to work. Before, before he ever gave him Eve, he gave him a job to do. You're going to name these animals, and now you're going to take care of all of them. And he did. And so work can be, work can be good, and work is, it ought to be good, and set goals with your work. You know, teach your children that. I said the other morning in Sunday school, uh, don't punish your children with work. Don't do that. That work is not a punishment. Work is a privilege. It's great to work. And, and when you work, you do the job, and you do it well, and you finish the job. If it's worth doing, it's worth doing right. And, and, then, and then challenge them to do it better the next time or to do it a little faster the next time. And through college, I delivered newspapers. I had 300 Chicago Tribunes and Chicago Sun-Times to deliver every night. And, up at, and, and be at the community news service at 2 a.m. And, and have to deliver those papers and get home uh, in time to get cleaned up and dressed and go to college. And, and every night, it was, a, it was a challenge to get the papers and then beat last night's time. May, may have, you know banged a few garage doors along the way or whatever. You throw them out the window. You threw papers out the window in your car. And, and, but you know what? I, I wasn't going to dread work. I was going to enjoy my work. And, and, and I'm kind of competitive, so I just make that a, a competition every night to, to beat that time from the previous night. And um, sorry about scraping that car, but I beat the time, you know? So look at learning as exciting and necessary, not a chore. And then number three, number three, this is good. Desire achievement, not acceptance. Desire achievement, not acceptance. John 8 and verse number 29, Jesus makes a statement. Jesus makes a statement in John 8 and verse 29 that only he can make. Okay? John 8 and verse number 29. Are you there? Say amen. He that has sent me is with me. The Father hath not left me alone, 
For I do always those things that, what church? Please Him. He's the only one that can say, I do always those things that please Him. We can say, I want to always do those things that please Him. But we fall short, don't we? But Jesus always did those things that please Him. That's what we're here for. We're here to please Him. Revelation 4.11 says that all the things that were created were created for His pleasure. You were created. I was created. Why? For His pleasure. I was created to please Him. And, and so often, what's the, what's the, that, that's what our new nature wants to do. That's what the Spirit of God tells us to do. Let's live to please God. But what is the old nature? What does the fallen nature desire us to do? Please God people or please ourselves we want to be accepted by other people i want to think i'm a kook i want to think i'm a religious nut hmm? See, i don't want to think i want them to think good of me but the greatest inventors the greatest writers the greatest preachers the greatest evangelists people we read about in books and such they they, they, they were great because they decided they wouldn't care what men thought of them they would live to please God. That's what's going to matter in the end. You know, Jesus would often condemn the Pharisees. And the biggest condemnation of the Pharisees was that they loved the praise of men. They did what they did to get the applause of men. They weren't, their, their thought wasn't, is God pleased? They just wanted everybody else to think they were good or they were holy or they were something. Do you do, you do things thinking about how to look to other people? Whether they're going to like you or not? See, it, 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 am I pleasing God? Look what Paul wrote in Galatians chapter 1. Turn to Galatians chapter 1. And again, uh, Paul writing to these churches here that were had some uh, people come in and try to teach another gospel after Paul left. And, and we're trying to influence the church in a bad way. And Paul writes to them in, in Galatians 1, notice verse 6. He said, I marvel that you're so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel. And then he tells them, it's not another. But there be some that trouble you and will pervert, pervert the gospel of Christ. And then he tells them in verse 8, Though we are an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. As we said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that ye have received, let him be accursed. Now notice verse 10. For do I now persuade men or God? Or do I seek to please men? For if I pleased men, I should not be the servant of Christ. I was saying that, what's the priority for the believer? Is it pleasing men or is it pleasing God? It has to be to please God. What's the, what's the main, listen, my job as the pastor is not to please you. I, I'm okay if you're pleased, but you ought to, my, my, my main concern is, do I please God? And, and your main concern ought to be, that your pastor pleases God. And, and there ought to be times when it doesn't please you too well. Because God will, God will uh, make us uncomfortable at times. And so we need to please the Lord. Uh, the psalmist wrote, no, Proverbs, I think it is, when a man's ways please the Lord, he maketh even his enemies to be at peace with him. It doesn't say his enemies will like him, but it does say they'll be at peace with him. See, because his ways please the Lord, okay? So, uh, desire achievement, not acceptance. Don't worry about acceptance with men. Number four, moving along. Number four, achievement then comes through labor, prayer, and patience. Achievement comes through labor, prayer, and patience. Hebrews 6 and verse 12. In Hebrews 6 and verse 12, the Bible says that ye be not slothful, 
but followers of them who faith through faith and patience inherit the promises. Who inherits the promises? Those who, first of all, they're not lazy, they're not slothful, but they use faith and patience to inherit the promises. Most of us, number one, we, we don't really want to, to, to have faith. We want to see everything. And secondly, we sure don't we sure don't do well with patience. Give me patience and I want it now. Hmm? Or that commercial they used to run on television. It's my money and I want it now. That's how it is. We we want everything and we want it now. And you listen, when you want it now, that's usually the flesh. The flesh doesn't want to wait for anything. We want it now. Achievement only comes after work, labor, prayer, perseverance, and patience. Success is getting up one more time than when you fell down. That's success. Someone said, if at first you don't succeed, you're running about average. Okay? Don't forget that. There's always setbacks. There's always adjustments. There's always obstacles. Always. But you have to exercise patience. Through patience, you inherit the promises. Noah, Noah was 120 years building the ark. And in 120 years, he didn't get anybody to believe him but his own sons, his own family members, nobody else. 120 years of people ridiculing him, making fun of him, saying comments about him. He, he had to persevere. He, he had to keep on, he had to have a lot of patience. You know, if I, can, if I can remind you of anything, I'll remind you that God is never in a hurry. If, no matter, we're in a hurry. Because we're in this, we're in this, we're in this uh, thing called time. Do you understand? God doesn't operate in time. That's why, that's why he says, uh, when Moses said, who will I say, shall I send me? He says, tell them, I am sent you unto them. Because he's I am. Why? God always operates in the present. He's the same I am tonight as he was I am back in Moses' day. He doesn't, uh, we, we, don't, we don't have any concept of that because we, we, it's hard for us to think outside of time. Because we're in that realm. But God doesn't operate that way. So sometimes when we think he's only got till Friday to answer, God has to smile a little bit, doesn't he? We think that, 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 that it's such a hurry to get there. Hebrews 12. You're in Hebrews 6. Look at Hebrews 12. Turn over to your right just a few pages. Hebrews 12. Again, familiar verses to you, but let's, let's look at them for a minute. No, it, notice it says, Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. God says you, you have to lay aside the weights and then the sin that so easily besets you and then run with patience. What's it take to run the Christian life and to run the race? Patience. You've got to have patience. You, you, you can't get in a hurry. You can't get in a rush. You can't push God. You have to have patience. It's what we talked about a few weeks ago. In due season, you shall reap if you faint not. But you've got to have patience. You know, and sometimes you, you don't even know. You know, I was thinking... Uh, last Saturday, my wife got to go up to Elyria. I think it's Victory Baptist Temple. 
uh, up there. Um, and Molly Schmale, Molly Schmale had spoken down here, I don't know how many years ago, it's been a few. And um, she asked my wife to come up and speak at a mother-daughter thing. And it was really interesting, a, a lady came up to my wife and asked if she knew, if she was Don Lesh's daughter. Yeah, said I am. She said he was our insurance agent 40 years ago. She said we were away from God and we went in to buy some insurance from him. And she said before we left, he was instrumental in us committing to get back into church and to get back serving God again. Isn't that something? You see, it's, you know what? He has, I was thinking, he I remember seeing trophies and different plaques and awards he got for, you know, selling life insurance and the different things you do in that industry, you know. And now that he's in heaven, you know what? I don't know where any of those things are. But that lady will be there. And the lives he influenced for Christ will be there. That's what really matters. You know, patience. Patience. In due season you shall reap if you faint not. Number five. Number five. Let God define success and not man. It goes along with what we just said. Let God define success and not man. Don't accept man's definition of success. The question is never, are others satisfied or am I satisfied? The question is, is God satisfied? Is God satisfied? You know why churches die? Churches die because... They, they, they define success as, well, we have this many people, we're good. And they don't continue to reach. They don't continue to uh, uh, get the gospel out. They don't continue to be aggressive in trying to get people saved. They just kind of settle in and say, we're good. Because look, everybody, anybody looks at us and says we're successful. But that's not who we're looking at. Remember, remember we talked uh, about the Laodicean church? how they viewed themselves, rich, increased with goods, in need of nothing. But is that how God saw them? No. So their idea, they were accepting an idea of success that God says you're not successful at all. Don't, don't settle for man's definition of success. Settle for God's definition. You want the applause of heaven, not the applause of men. You see, God knows God knows my potential. God knows your potential. God knows that the works, you know, in Ephesians 2.10, that he has, uh, he, he, his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which he hath before ordained that we should walk in them. God knows the works that he's preordained for you, and he knows the works he's preordained for me. So he knows whether we're walking in them or not. I don't know whether you're walking in the works God has for you or not. You don't know if I'm walking in the ones he asked for me, but he knows. So I can't look at your life and say you're successful. You can't look at mine and say I'm successful. That's why I think, I think uh, that's one of the meanings maybe that the Lord meant when he said the, the last will be first and the first will be last. The people who we thought were numero uno down here, little Spanish for you there, Philemon. Uh, numero uno down here, God says they're going to be last up there. Sometimes we think some of the big, maybe the big name preachers we saw down there, they, boy, I can't wait to watch them get their awards in heaven. They may step back and some guy you never heard of, never seen before, step up and everybody will be saying, who's that guy? Huh? Who's that guy? But that's, that's because God will define success in that day, not man. Not man. And so he's the, he's the only one who can say, well done. Thou good and faithful servant. No one else can. Okay, number six. Number six, desire team success over individual success. If you're going to be what God wants you to be, you desire team success over your new success. What, you know, it's a sad reality in pro sports now is that most of the players are just playing for a paycheck. They're playing for money. And, and they are grossly overpaid. Just, just say it. And I love sports. Grew up loving sports. 
and I still watch sports. I'd, I'd probably rather watch college athletes play than I would professional ones. But, but one, of the, one of the worst things that's happened in sports is this thing called fantasy. Are you familiar with fantasy football, fantasy baseball, fantasy basketball? And what that is, is you pick individuals. And you pick these individuals for your team. For instance, if it's basketball. And then on even, any given night, if those players are playing, their team's playing, you just take whatever stats they get. And you have these guys. You may have 10 different guys from 10 different teams, but you're just using their individual stats. It doesn't matter how their team did. It just matter how they played as an individual. And if enough of those guys played well, your team will beat whatever team you're playing. But it's all based on the individual. And so the individual, I don't care how their team did, if he did good, you see, and and that's that that's that's horrible. It doesn't matter how well you do if your team loses. Do you understand? Did you grow up that way, brother Yoder? I mean, I don't want to. I don't care. How I did. If the team lost, we lost. That's the bottom line. I want to win, and and. I'd rather, I'd rather sit on the bench of a winning team than be the star on a losing team that never wins anything. I, I want to, uh, listen, you know who Satan is? Satan's the star on a losing team. I don't care to be on the losing team. In fact, we sing, I'm on the winning side. We're on the winning team. Hey, don't forget that. And when you're on the winning team, it's not about individuals. Christianity is not about individuals listen carefully everyone's needed no one is necessary did you get that everyone's needed but no one is necessary we're all we're all needed but nobody's indispensable I mean, we're needed and we're all part of the body, but nobody's, everybody's replaceable. If I drop dead of a heart attack, you'll have some men to get together and you'll call another pastor. And another pastor will come in and the church goes on. It, 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 for, for 20 some years, Pastor Rock was pastoring his church. But when the Lord had him move on, guess what? He called another pastor. And the work goes on. God's work is bigger than any individual. There's never been, no matter how great the preacher is, no matter how great the Christian is, there's never been a Christian that, that passed away, that died, and God said, oh my, what am I going to do now? No, 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 no. we all members of the body, His church. Okay? We're all members of that body. Now, no part of your body an arm, a leg, a, an ear, an eye. No part of your body is going to operate well apart from your body. You know, my dad, most of you know he played baseball. And uh, he was with the Cardinal organization in the early 50s. And uh, he uh, had his career shortened and uh, really ended it when he got hit with a line drive in the eye. Uh, back of the pitcher's mound. He got his glove up, it tipped off his glove, and it knocked his left eye out. Well, my, my dad had a plastic eye. And, um, and, you know, you're going back as a kid and growing up in the 60s. And um, my dad would, uh, we had great fun with it, you know what I mean? He, he, would, he would take his eye out, you know, he'd lay it on the counter there. You know, and we'd always, we were kids, you know, and we said, better brush our teeth, dad's watching, you know, <laughs> and uh, things like that, you know. And... Had, had some fun with that eye. But you know what? You, 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 can take that, you take that eye and set it down. Now, he couldn't see out of there or anything. It was just so he would look like it. You wouldn't want to see a guy with no eyeball, you know? And uh, it was just for looks. But you can't take an eye out and, and think it's still going to work. You can't take your ear off. You can't take an arm off and lay it down and expect your arm to work. You're, you're, you're members of a body. We function together. Uh, we're all one, okay? We can, you, can, you can get by sometimes if you break an arm and you've got to put it in a sling or something happens, you've got to have surgery and you, have, you, you, you learn to do some things, 
but you don't want to live that way forever. You're glad when you get that arm working again and everything's functioning again the way it's supposed to. That's, that's what you want, and that's the way the church is. But it's always about the cause of Christ. It's always about the, the cause of his church. It's never about me. Don't ever make it about you. Well, nobody appreciates me. Nobody does. Nobody works harder at that church than I do. Well, you got a you got an eye problem. Okay, you need to go to the eye doctor, God, and have them to take care of your eye problem. All right. Desire the team success over individual success. Number seven is this: never settle for average. Never settle for average. Good enough isn't in the vocabulary of the believer. When it comes to serving God, don't look at something, ah, that's good enough. Used to, used to say when you're working, well, good enough for government work. No, don't do that. That'll do. No. Ecclesiastes says, whatsoever thy hand findeth to do, do it with thy might. Rise above mediocrity. Don't settle for mediocre. Lift your limits. Desire to be what God wants you to be. Don't, don't, don't let the army say be all you can be. Let God say be all you can be. Be all that God desires you to be. I like this. Often we, we are not receiving God's best because we're willing to settle for less than His best. As long as you can live without God's best, you will. You will. 2 Corinthians chapter 3. This will be our last one and we'll be done. 2 Corinthians chapter 3. Would you look there please? 2 Corinthians chapter 3. Great verses here. 2 Corinthians 3. Notice with me verses 17 and 18. 2 Corinthians 3, 17 and 18. Now the Lord is that Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. But we all, with open face beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image from glory to glory. So we're beholding with an open face as in a glass. I believe that's God's Word. And we're looking at it and we're seeing the glory of the Lord. And God says, as you look into that glass and you study that, He says, you'll be changed into that image from glory to glory. How does that happen? Even as by the Spirit of the Lord. You, you get into God's Word and you spend time with God and you spend time with the Lord Jesus. You spend time with the written Word and God will make you into the image of the living Word. How does He do that? By the Spirit of God. This is a spiritual book. You have the author living inside of you if you're a Christian. And the Spirit of God begins to change your heart. The Spirit of God brings about the changes in your life. Hey, can I help some of you? That means you don't have to bring about changes in other people's lives. Let the Spirit of God bring it about. Let the Spirit of God do it. If the Spirit of God does it, it'll be lasting change. If you do it, it won't last. You won't last. Everyone in this room has done something at one time or another in your life because you felt someone else wanted you to do it. And at some point, you gave up and said, I'm through doing that. But everybody in this room has also been convicted or, or convinced by God that you should do something. And you're still doing it today. Because the difference is the Spirit of God can let the Spirit of God change you into the glory and the image of Christ. And can I say there's nothing average about living for God? There's nothing average about that. It's a grand thing to be a Christian. It's the best thing I know. Let's be the, let's kind, let's be the kind of people God desires us to be. I'll tell you something that was, that was really enjoyable this week. 
Sunday night. Anybody remember Sunday night? Yeah, I know. That's so, that's so uh, three days ago or whatever, <laughs> four days ago. How's that? You know, it was really funny. I mean, did you remember what I preached on Sunday night? Huh? Bob Reed does? Scotty does? Xavier? What I preach on, Xavier? Bring him to Jesus. So we talked about everybody get one, right? And, and you know what's really, what's really, I'll say this too, you know, it's funny. Uh, Molly Schmann was talking to my wife on the phone and she was just talking about the church service and everything just before she went up there. And she said, well, what did your husband preach about on Sunday? <laughs> yeah, and my wife said, oh, it was really good. <laughs> and that's okay, because then she asked me and I said, I don't know what I preached on Sunday either, right? Man. When, when you preach Sunday and then you preach, you know, three radio programs and five radio programs a week and, you know, Wednesday night study and a Sunday school lesson, I don't know what I preached on last, but <laughs> Sunday night I preached that message. About halfway through the message, a young man walked in and sat in the back there and Bill McKeon started talking to him, John, and um, afterwards brought him down to the office. And John had had some, some problems in his life and, and such, and we talked about those and in fact, he said, I was walking here down Broadway. He said, and I, he, really despondent, really discouraged, he said, I actually thought about stepping out in front of a car and into my life. He said, but instead of looking to the left, I looked to the right, and I saw your church sign. And something just told me, go to that church. And so he walked down here and walked in halfway through the service, halfway through the message, really. And so Bill brought him down there, we talked, and he told me that story. And I said, well, John, if you would have stepped in front of the car, and you would have died, are you 100% sure you'd go to heaven? He said, oh, no, I'm sure I wouldn't have. I'd have, I'd have went to purgatory. I said, well, he said, if there was a way you could know, 100% sure that you go to heaven, and the Bible told you that way, would you be interested in what the Bible had to say about it? He said, I sure would. And Sunday night, after saying, bring them to Jesus, God brought one to us. And he prayed in the office and asked Christ to be his Savior. I think we'll see him Saturday and Sunday. And so, you know, it, it, isn't that neat? You think it doesn't, you don't, you don't think living for God's exciting? You don't think that being a Christian is the greatest thing in the world? It's a grand thing to be a Christian. It's the best thing I know. But that only happens if you want to be what God wants you to be. And I hope that's helped you tonight. Let's stand together, shall we? Father, thank you for this evening now. Thank you, Lord, for the attention of everyone tonight. I pray your blessing upon each individual. I pray, Lord, that each of us will leave this place desiring to be what you want us to be. Lord, we pray that you'll bless the remainder of flyers as they go out. Touch the hearts of people who receive them. Give us a great crowd on Saturday. Open the hearts of people to the gospel. Help us to come with a mind to serve and a, a, a mind to glorify you and a mind that, Lord, we want to bring somebody to Jesus on Saturday. May your hand be upon all the preparation that's being done. Lord, may you bless it in a special way. Dismiss us now with your care, please. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. Amen. Well, the windows of heaven are open. The blessings are falling tonight. 128, if you need it in the book, let's sing it together. Here we go. The windows of heaven are open. The blessings are falling tonight. There's joy, joy, joy in my heart since Jesus made everything right. I gave him my old tattered garments. He gave me a robe of pure white. I'm feasting on manna from heaven. And that's why I'm happy. That's why you're happy. That's why we're happy tonight. God bless you. You're dismissed. Choir, come right on up.